Throughout history, free thinkers have outraged the religious with their wacky ideas about the virtues of free speech, reason, and of course, eating babies. Now, God is dying, and it's time to dispose of his remains. From the pits of hell, Satan sends two puppets of the imperialist West and the Zionist Jews against God, Islam, and tiny kittens to bring you their propaganda and conspire for a new world order. This is Secular Jihadist for a Muslim Enlightenment with Ali Rizwi and Armin Navabi. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Secular Jihadists for a Muslim Enlightenment. My name is Ali Rizvi. Armin couldn't make it today uh, because of time zone differences, and our guest is actually in uh, in Europe this time. So, you know, we've had to figure things out either way, right? Uh, so I want to get right to it. Um, we actually have a, uh, you know, just this is a comedian that I met last year in Amsterdam, and I have just been a fan of her ever since. So... Um, Shabana Rahman Garter uh, is a Pakistani Norwegian comedian. Uh, she was raised Muslim. Now she calls herself a free thinker. Uh, she's been featured in the New York Times. She's been featured in Time Magazine. Um, she's known for humor that is shocking, but always has wit and always has purpose. And it's it's actually very very intelligent. Um, most famously, what what she did was like uh, this is the incident. I think Shabana is when you lifted a, a a Islamic leader, a fundamentalist Islamic leader, off the ground during a public debate, just to show that okay, if he could be lifted, he can't be that harmful, uh, which was hilarious. It was infuriated him, it emasculated him, and he complained to the police, but it didn't go anywhere, as it shouldn't. Um, so she's brilliant, she's biting, she's hilarious. And Shabana is here, and she's joining us on the podcast. Welcome, Shabana. It's an honor to speak to you. Thank you. Hello from Oslo. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, so that's, Yeah, that's so that's great. So I got to ask you something. We've had some, you know, like I'm, I'm a big stand-up comedy fan and just comedy fan in general, and we've had several on this show. We've had, you know, Jafar Khan has been on here we've, from, from New York. Uh, we've had... Um, uh, uh, Vidu Vids from the UK is pretty well known, you know, Vidu. And then we've also had Mohanad El Sheikhi. Mohanad is a, he's a Libyan comedian from Benghazi and he kind of made it really big in the US. And now over the last few years, now he's writing for, for Full Frontal with Samantha B. Wow. So, yeah, so he's, so we've had these people, yeah, they're all from Muslim backgrounds, just like you are. What is it? But the comedians who come from Muslim backgrounds always end up being, you know, ex-Muslims or free thinkers, secular. What is it about comedy that makes you that way? Or is it, or are you that way? That's why you go into comedy. Mm. Which is it? Yeah, it's a good question, Ali. And um, I don't think you become secular, you become free thinker. I think before being a com comedian, before that, persona get out of you get out of the closet uh you have already you are already there you have always been there maybe you're not aware of that um uh, if not you have been an activist <laughs> maybe yeah. and not uh, not a comedian and i didn't choose comedy because i was like this good school girl who wanted to you know study maybe literature or um i actually wanted to be a teacher so the comedy chose me, and I'm still running away from it. <laughs> but, yeah. but you know, the, the, the thing you do and the way you see the world, um, and a lot of this is, is crazy stuff, and the way you put your word, your perspective on it, the world finds it funny. So it wasn't a career uh, choice for me but it became that way because that was the only stage where yeah. you can could save uh, and share the way right. you see the world and, and it's, the world it's, finds it funny <laughs> yeah that's a that's a great way to put it the, the thing is and it's not just people from muslim backgrounds it's uh um also i mean i've seen like aziz ansari an atheist he's an atheist to the extent that when the new york times called him muslim he sent them a correction that they had mm. to put a correction that, you know, 
he isn't Muslim. He call he identifies as an atheist. And then Kumail Nanjiani is another sort of uh, Pakistani comedian. Uh, also did stand up. He's now he's doing movies. Um, mm. And he's also very very secular. And, and it's not just the people from the Muslim backgrounds, but I think George Carlin. I remember George Carlin speaking so adamantly against religion as well, right? I mean, he was known for being like just a really biting critic of mm. religion and faith. So it's it's always been a, a theme. You know, yeah, and that's interesting, actually, because I was going to arrest you as well when you say she has this Muslim background, raised as a Muslim. And you know what? I thought it's OK, because, yeah, I wasn't raised as a Muslim. I came from a secular family. And um, my belief is that I never uh, ch uh, choose um, any religion. So why should I be identified as Muslim? But uh, even though that this is my, my belief, but I was born in a Muslim fa family. I had this Muslim background. I speak Urdu. Um, I have a family who said, inshallah, <laughs> we, yeah. we have all this. So, you know, why uh, say no to that? Why don't embrace it and see this is the way people from born in a Muslim family could also be? Mm -hmm. It's okay. So uh, I think what uh, most uh, uh, comedians, if we point, point out Muslim comedians, um, some of them, uh, uh, or maybe the reason it become a theme is that, you know, they don't want to be, have this tattoo with Muslim comedian on their uh, forehead yeah. because, you know, because they want to be um, equal to all free comedians. They don't want to use this as their uh, type or thing. Uh, right. But I, I think uh, I'm there now in my life that I, I, I'm thinking, why don't jump into it and see what yeah. comes out? <laughs> no, no. no I, I, yeah, that's a, and I, I like that. I, I think that one of the things that, one of the most powerful ways to get this across, like, you know, people talk about diversity and everything all the time is the diversity within the Muslim community is that, yes, you know, you've got the religious, conservative, those types of Muslims, but then you have people like yourself and people like me who are, you know, it's, it's just, no, it just, we just happen to be born into Muslim families, but just the rest of it, we're all just, we human and it's yeah. good for people to see that. It's good for, that is a more powerful way to dispel this whole stereotype of yes. Muslims in the community than anything else, because there are a lot of us, I mean, people don't realize we just don't make the news as much as usually the crazies who make the news. But I, the majority of people out there are just regular people who just want to live their lives. Yeah, and, and they're breaking the secular. message. Yeah, and the, just, just like religion is, uh, you know, in all the other religions, people are becoming less religious. Christians are becoming like the millennials, the younger generations are, I think, over a third of them are not. And we've, we've had polls out of Iran, out of Iraq, out of Saudi yeah. Arabia. And you don't hear that. that. You don't hear that. Oh, you are so you are not Christian anymore. So you are a comedian now, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But we hear that all the time. So have you left Islam? Yes, I have, but I never actually chose Islam. <laughs> but yes, yeah. I'm born in a Muslim family. So there are differences way uh, people are receiving uh, comedians with much Muslim background, and I think we should look into that and still tell the world who we are and what right. we stand for. Yeah. So how did you start? Like you, so you were born in Pakistan, right? Yes. And then you I was moved... born in Karachi uh -huh. and uh, I came to Norway when I was two years old. So uh, I was raised in a uh, very multicultural neighborhood in Oslo. Right. And for me, that was the normal. So when I started uh, writing for a huge national newspaper as a columnist, uh, I was 18 years old mm -hmm. and I had a, I have totally free uh, pen, free writing. I just wrote my thoughts. Uh, but at that point, there were, weren't any other columnist with um, immigrant background in uh, right. a national Norwegian paper. It, they were totally, you know, um, white writers and right. uh, so i was surprised by that attention uh, this is a pakistani girl 
uh, we are not observing them anymore. No, they are writing their thoughts. <laughs> it was before the bloggers and all that. <laughs> right. So, yeah, yeah. I'm old. <laughs> I think you were probably around the same age. You were born in the yeah. 70s, 70s kid? Yeah, 76. Yeah, 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 I was born in 75. I'm still yeah. That's good. So, you know, in the 80s, it was very common in Norway to uh, sunbath without anything uh, on your upper body. Right. Uh, so I uh, was my one of my first columns was about that how it is to sunbath naked. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you got the picture and yeah. that's, the the reaction comes from Norwegians. Oh my God, she's from Pakistan. We have never uh, seen anyone sunbathing like this. But that was a total normal thing in the eighties uh, yeah. in Norway. Uh, so I was receiving this attention and I'm like, okay, this is my daily life. This is something I do. Yeah, my father might have slapped me if he watched me, but I was going to the <laughs> beach and sunbathing like everyone else. Uh, but, but then I just continued to write. And uh, I think my first column was a kind of stand-up funny stuff, but I didn't um, knew about stand-up comedy. So then I met um, um, another uh, Pakistani uh, comedian um, and he had been a comedian since he was born so yeah. uh, we went to child uh, uh, school together his name is Sahid Ali one of Norway's most famous uh, comedians hey. uh, he invited me to his stand-up show and I was I just l loved it because this was the stage I was missing this was the voice I was missing grow you know growing up in a multicultural um neighborhood with a public picture of us which was really um um, um receiving us as totally strangers but i didn't know any other country in norway so yeah. i thought wow i should write for that guy i want to write comedy for him and then uh -huh. he asked me uh why don't you do it by yourself so i had never you know hold a uh, microphone or I was totally scared by the stage and he said, okay, you just do it for two minutes. If it do didn't work out, you can leave. Yeah. So I went up on stage and my, one of my um, first lines was about some headlines were um, about Muslim girls who were um, traveling to Copenhagen to have suit on hymens, you know? Oh, just to, to get their hymens repaired, right? The virginity yeah, so they, restoration. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. they can uh, have their arranged marriages or whatever. And the Norwegian media was uh, describing these girls as liars. You know, oh, they lie. And, you know, it was like, um, no. <laughs> why don't you ask why they are doing this? So my first uh, joke or uh, was about, I grew up in Norway. I'm totally like every other Norwegian girl, except for one thing, I'm a virgin. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it's because I have Sue on uh, my hymen. <laughs> so I have been fucking around. I have been in everything else, uh, but uh, when I'm tired of all that shit, yeah, uh, and need a nice, uh, suitable husband. I just do that. So it it was a comment on what media was seeing, and that was this uh, opening, and that was the start of my comedy. Uh, right. And it was something new, uh, something fresh in the Norwegian comedy scene, and that leads to mula lifting and mooning, and I don't know. Yeah, everything. <laughs> So so let's let's pause for a second. So you you did this first joke. This was your first stand up gig. And and how old yes. are you at this time? I was twenty three years old. Twenty three years old. And, and how was it received? Well, was the first it, reaction. Um, the reaction was actually uh, it was just a a small headline in a local newspaper. Uh, so but the audience, like the audience, like you, you they had loved a gig. it. They, they loved laughed. It. So you killed right from the beginning. Yes, right from the beginning. It was yeah. I was uh, having my two minutes, and I was uh, on the stage for fifteen minutes at the sports <laughs> bar, uh, where I had never been to before, and uh, I have 
they invited me again, back again and again. Wow. And I, yeah, totally scared and totally surprised. What happened now? What <laughs> happened? <laughs> And then you got, not only did you get a great audience reaction, but then you also got a headline in the paper. Yes. I I received instant love and laughter. Yeah. And I realized that this audience, this society, they aren't against minorities. They aren't a racist nation. They are not excluding us. They need to hear our voices as we are. Our humor, yeah. our laughter our heart, they just waiting for it. Right. This is uh, where I, I think um, Kamel Nanjiani said, he's like, you know, we want to, I think, he, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he wanted to start like a Tumblr or some sort of blog just called Muslims doing boring things, like having ice cream, <laughs> just doing regular, he's like, we just need to do that. So we can throw it out there that there's like just, regular people not everybody's like a religious maniac you just you're just born into something if you're born into something that doesn't define who you are right yeah um so yeah so i love this uh, so so you you start this way and then you get this instant love appreciation how do your parents react to this now they're reading about you in the paper talking about sewing on your hymen back again and you know all this and and they're obviously you know from karachi from pakistan so yeah so how how was that? Did they know? Did they react? Well, my family knew me. <laughs> they know how how I was. So for I have you know six brothers and sisters, and I'm in the middle, and I'm the crazy one. And but I'm also the the one who always uh, was the person who you know was um, outspoken. Uh, so they weren't surprised. They, they just see, oh, it's her, it's her personality, and now it's on stage. Oh my God! <laughs> but uh, and I have al already been columnist uh, at the national newspaper, so I, I was already, you know, they were used to me being in the media and hearing my voice. But my the, my second show, uh, my four brothers uh, were uh, at the audience, uh -huh. and they applauded. it. And I was talking about one night stands and, you know, all that things in, in Norwegian girls do at 23 yeah. uh, age, party and all that daily stuff. Um, and then there was a TV station there and um, they were um, filming me and they were filming the audience, my brothers, uh, and they were clapping. So the thing is that this got a huge attention. And you know why? Because the week before, one of Norway, Norway's uh, biggest um, uh, debate program had done this journalism on, and that was really awful. They were following a murder in uh, Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Uh, where they went to the jail in Pakistan and interviewed a, a guy who had killed his sister at honor killing. Right. I think she was from Norway. So therefore a Norwegian um, film team went, a documentary team went to Pakistan. And from that uh, jail, the brother was saying that he was honored to kill his sister. He was really honored and that was the right thing to do. He, he didn't have any shame and uh, that was, you know, um, sent on prime time in Norwegian television uh, in a situation where we still didn't know, knew each other, you know, as, uh, uh, as a society. That was uh, the program sent a week before. And there, it was the same team who was audience watching my stand-up, which was only 15 minutes. I only, it was my second show and they wanted to interview my brother. Mm -hmm. How can you as a Pakistani uh, brother see your sister on stage talking free like this and accept this and applaud it? Mm -hmm. And they asked me, could you please, uh, you know, join this interview, your brother and with your brother. The first I said, no. Uh, I was like, oh, no, I'm a comedian. I don't want to be this political commenter. No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, I want to, you know, be seen uh, with my art. And 
all that stuff. And then I realized that, why not? Mm -hmm. Why not? Why being afraid of this? Why not make comedy out of this? Why not say it? And my brother agreed. And I think we were the first um, sisters and brother in, it must be any European TV station where my brother was beside me and he said openly, this is my sister. Her honor is in her body. I don't own her honor and it's, it's okay. I, I love her, I want to protect her, but I don't own her voice, her body, her freedom. He can, she can do whatever uh, she wants. But then he also honestly said, I wasn't raised this way. Yeah. I was raised to follow them. I was raised to feel anger if they do something. Uh, other people from the com com community will point on us. I was raised to, to take their hair and, you know, grab them at home if I didn't like it. Uh, I don't remember he was raised that way, but he, <laughs> and he never did that. But, you know, I have seen Pakistani girls in my neighborhood experience that. I have felt that my brother ha had this pressure on, and I was proud that he put word on it. And, yeah. and then he explained, I, it ca came to a point where I got a girlfriend. She was at the same age as my sister, and I wanted to meet her. And I start thinking that why can she meet me and my sisters can? And these questions are sensitive. I hope they're not anymore, but it, it was, this was in year 2000. Yeah. You know, this reflection on manhood, he did this on television. And after that, the criticism started. The death threats came. Yeah. So I, I think that what he said, um, the reason that it's so important is that it acknowledges, as you said, it acknowledges both sides of these things. Because you usually see, you know, with especially with the Pakistani or, you know, Muslim men or especially conservative men, actually not even, not, not even liberal men, like a, a, just what they do is they'll either they're going to be like okay no this is my sister I have to protect her she can't do this right and they'll disapprove mm -hmm. or on the other hand um the ones that are more sort of open will say this is my sister look at us we are muslims too and you know we are like this as well and there's no problem anywhere but he didn't do that he he first stood up for you and he said he doesn't own you but then he also acknowledged that for him to start thinking this way took effort it took reflection on the way he was raised he had to actually um break away from the way that he was raised and I'm, i know that in your family he probably wasn't raised that way but as you said within the community the societal pressure the kind of background the structure, that you structure the structure was there also in the my structure family there right there is a pressure there's the honor thing right like where you know if you don't yeah. if you like, I, I still get people you know telling me you know like wait why is your wife doing this you know keep your wife under control and mm -hmm. it's actually not even just from muslim men it's from like all kinds of things there is a structure out there that tells like if there if there's a woman that's doing something that people don't like they mm -hmm. will write to her husband they'll write to her father they'll write to her brother mm -hmm. right that what do you why are you letting her do this yes you know? and if you don't have the reflection inside your family you you don't have you know the sec security to reflect openly yeah. uh, you will never get into that you will start doing what other ex expect and then you will also find excuses in your religion and your culture we are this way what is the problem you know mm -hmm. and then you become that man uh, who yeah. who hurt your women in your family and even uh, women come that way they are over controlling it and you know that we are talking actually about double standards you know yeah. and to go into that and accept it yes there are double standards and i don't want to live this way and this is how we are dealing with this 
So mm -hmm. we are we, we what we also did break through it's you know freedom of speech to um, discuss this openly, and it is okay. But uh, in year two thousand, it wasn't okay. You it know, yeah. then you was a traitor or all that stuff. You know, already. I, yeah, I, I think the visibility of people like yourself um, and other people from Pakistani Muslim backgrounds and in the comedy scene, in in the arts, I think has probably been more powerful um, in dispelling or just at least uh, heterogeneizing or whatever if that's a word like the the experience the perception of what people yeah. from the backgrounds are. And I think that's important. It's not just important for people in the West to know. I mean, that that doesn't matter as much. But I think what's really important for me is for young people to know that this is an option. For mm -hmm. them to, you know, because I, I get that a lot. And, you know, when I wrote my book, when I started talking about these things, mm -hmm. when I was growing up, I just knew that, okay, there were conservative Muslims who were the mullahs, and then there were the liberal Muslims. And you have to be one of these. Right? Mm -hmm. There was no option of being out of this cult at all and and then you know now i i, I the, one of the most frequent things i hear from young people is that oh i didn't know that you could do this i didn't know this was an option you can also do this you can leave you can and still do eid and ramadan all that stuff with your parents and the say inshallah whatever you know we still have that in our families but you know you don't have to it doesn't have to go with the burden of the ideology yeah, and that I think that is a direct result of be, being visible. Mm. You know, uh, it, it's it's funny because uh, actually yesterday uh, at the train station, uh, a very young Pakistani um, boy came to me, um, and I had you know this mask on uh, and Corona and everything, and he was uh, really polite, and he came to me and he said, "Are you Shabana?" So yes, yes, I grew up, I grew up watching you, and. I just have to say, um, I was full of hate uh, when I grew up, uh, you know, seeing you in the media. Uh, but now I have changed. Um, our culture needs freedom. He was so precise. I was like, what? what? Our culture needs freedom. Please go on with your work. Is, isn't that the most uh, moving thing, like when that happens? When I was. Up to you I was and... almost crying because, yeah. when, you know, when people say that, especially young people, you know, you realized all that shit you have been through, <laughs> you, you start remembering and wow, this is the seeds, you know, yeah. this is keep thinking, keep act. And then he, he just went away and that I, I wanted to ask him, what changed you? What did you experience? You that's know? That's right. Yeah. It's, it's and it's, I, I think that that's ultimately what matters i mean there's and i've always heard you know we would because I'm, I'm a physician so we always talked about smoking cessation how do you get people to quit smoking <laughs> people would say education 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 and then you know then you realize i'm like okay well you know i'm a cancer pathologist but mm. i still smoke right because i like it if there's <laughs> anybody for whom education would work as a deterrent it would be me but mm. the place education isn't actually very effective when it comes to these things when it comes to mm -hmm. habitual or addictive things and i think that you know religious thinking and cultural indoctrination is 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 very similar to that but what works is that if the education is done before somebody even picks up a cigarette right so when you're mm -hmm. when you're a teenager before you've started that's when you get the education and that prevents people from starting it in the first place so i've so, always uh Sorry, yeah, and part of the edu education could be that you are, you know, that people like you, me, uh, are visible. So it do doesn't have to be at schools. It's what your culture, what your art, you know, mm -hmm. what your writers actually show and speak and are exactly. there, yeah. are there and still standing there. That's right. And then I think it's like most of whatever uh, I do, and it seems like what you do too, is uh, there is something in mind that I want younger people, like my main audience, if I had to choose, there's many audiences, if there's one audience I had to choose, it would be the younger people who are growing up like I did. And I, I grew up in Saudi Arabia, right? So oh, okay. <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> so the kids over there were growing up like 
me and looking at everything around them, they're like, oh, this is really weird, right? Those kids, they know that, okay, you know, there, there is somebody who's been through this and they have that experience. And I think that that's one thing that, that the young person who came to you mm. was also thinking that, you know, when he was younger and he was full of hate and he would, he'd been given a certain societal or cultural narrative, mm. and then he grew up watching you, he saw a completely different side of things from somebody who was also part of that community. Mm. Yes. Right? And that, that gives you, it gives you an option. It gives you an out. It starts to get you thinking, even if you initially react with anger. Yeah. And That's you know, the, 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 the very important thing is because I have been doing this for two decades though, right? right. And uh, the, one of the things, you know, you've been taught that if you go this way, uh, you will destroy your life. You know, you, you will just lose everything. No one will care for you and you will be totally alone. Um, so it's more important as a grown-up woman now to be visible. You know, it's a strong message in I'm still here. Yeah. And and I'm okay. I have a dogs and cats. Okay, I didn't get kids. <laughs> they told me that too. <laughs> that happened. <laughs> um, but I'm happy. I'm okay. I'm, st I'm still doing my work. I'm still speaking, still writing. And it have been like, 25 years it's, I'm still here yeah. and and to be still there to you know to keep going um this is the way that you get there that the next generation can actually come and see and say and it's okay so you know you show them the way but you have to be there yeah so too many people you know get tired they do. want to get into silent or want to uh, do uh, you know choose another work don't want all that attention because it is tiring you know it is yeah it, it, it must be so i i have a, so some a question to you like the, there's a so you you famously the way that you do things there are layers to it so you know how sasha baron cohen was one you know one of the greatest comedians alive ever mm -hmm. um is it anytime he does something that's just funny like borat just funny immigrant guy <laughs> crazy things yeah. but he exposes layers of society right like he exposes for example how people think of immigrants like an immigrant can come in show them pictures of engaging in incest with their son and <laughs> and they'd be like oh that's very nice we just don't do that here right so <laughs> that's the thing they have this Okay, people overseas, they do whatever. You know, they, they, it's the cultural relativism. He kind of exposes that mm. in a way. And so you do similar things with your comedy in the sense that you take, um, you went up, you were in a public debate, I guess, with a mullah. Or I don't know if you were in public debate with him, but it was anyway, it was in public. And this He was actually promoting his book. It was a, a mullah who was um, accused for being a terrorist and he was uh, living in a, uh, as a refugee in Norway. So the Norwegian law was actually protecting him. Mm -hmm. And during that time, he wrote a book, he, uh, uh, autobiography you know, about his life. Right. And um, so, uh, and he was uh, really famous uh, in, in Norway. He was the most famous uh, accused to be terrorist mullah. <laughs> so, <laughs> But, but the launch of his book was um, at a nightclub. And, yeah. um, and uh, so th there were going to be a debate about his book and there was a very skeptic audience there. Uh, I was just passing by, this wasn't planned. And I saw this poster outside this nightclub that Mullah Krekar is going to be there. And, you know, I was doing my comedy, having this reaction. And my first thought was a Mullah in a nightclub? wow what a sensation i i just yeah. went, went in there and uh the atmosphere there were full of fear uh people were sitting like this uh, it, it was packed uh but the small lad was smiling and he said he's not a uh, danger for the norwegian society i'm a good man and this is sharia <laughs> this is my beliefs and uh and his wife was also there in full uh, you know, hijab and uh, full covered, but there were people uh, uh, in between the audience were having their beers and wines and 
watching this. It was a really weird scene. Uh, so he was uh, trying to convince the Norwegian audience that he isn't a danger for Norway's security. Uh -huh. and, and so this was just, you know, uh, intuitive thought I got where I lifted my hand first and said, I can help you uh, to see if you're a dangerous man or not. Yeah. And uh, and he said yes, because th th they opened for questions. So I went on the stage and I put my arms around him and I lifted him up. And it was like four seconds. <laughs> Just lifted him off the ground. <laughs> off the ground. And it was a really childish thing to do. And the layers, you know, it, it wasn't uh, even anything uh, uh, like an immigrant comedy. It wasn't uh, anything like uh, taking the prejudges or something. It, it mm -hmm. just happened there and then. And on his way up, he was smiling. But up there, the people with all that skepticism, they started to laugh, instantly laugh, just of the picture of his being lifted. So when he realized that everybody's laughing, I could feel that he went into totally fear himself. He, he went totally, you know, like this. And then I gently put him down. And then he, he went totally crazy. He you said that, me. yeah, but he said, the first thing he said was, why didn't she kiss me? And people are, what? 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 Yeah, but yeah, I have analyzed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he said, why didn't she kiss me? And he said, this is not right. A woman shouldn't do that. So in that line, why didn't she kiss me? He was actually saying that he uh, uh, think that this lifting thing was, uh, you know, a sexual offend. Yeah. It was a nice way to see why didn't she kiss me? Yeah. So, yeah. and that was the, the police report uh, when uh, he made the day after. It was sexual offense done by, by me. Yeah. And because for, for his belief, touching a strange man like this was mm -hmm. offensive, really yeah. offensive. Was there like a, well, I know what would have happened today if you had done that. There would have everybody be talking about consent and, you know, you hold held him and you picked him up and there was no consent. What do you say to people who say that, that, okay, well, you know, you lifted him alone without his consent and you went and you touched him without his consent? Well, uh, in the Norwegian debate, what people said was uh, that uh, the left wings and the right wings said totally different things about the lifting. It went, you know, world around. It was a world around news. So mm -hmm. the left wing said that you you should have respected his culture. Uh, you you behave like a bad uh, Norwegian comedian. Um, you You're should, from I, the same culture, though. I know. <laughs> and I know. Then I just suddenly became a white, uh, crazy, disrespectful <laughs> comedian. Uh, but the right wing said, after you lifted him, you should have thrown him out of the country. Why is oh, this God. shit man here? I was like, and I think both sides was wrong. And the Obviously. layers, the layers came mm -hmm. on how people were debating this. And yeah. I don't know if I could do this today, you know, with all this cancel culture and all these things happening now. But many of my stunts, which I have done during the, for 10 years ago, it will not be done today either easily. Well, probably not easily, but that's the whole thing. <laughs> look, I, look, the thing with comedy is that you're not supposed to do things that are easy. I mean, that, that's, that's true. Not, that's true. You have to, I, I think that this is, look, this but all. You have to do this. All this cancel culture stuff. I mean, you. It's on Twitter, right? I mean, you know, you know, if if uh, um, uh, I, I don't know anybody, if Susan B. Anthony was on Twitter and she said, oh, "I think women should have the right to vote," she would be canceled at the time. Like any anything that has been transformative in history, anything that has brought about a lot of change, those people they tried to cancel them. But you just keep pushing on. So you did, um, you did another sort of uh, comedic stunt, right? yeah, and you, went, and you mooned the audience. I right? mooned. I moved the audience on stage. 
Uh, yeah. I, I, I was wearing a very nice Pakistani suit. You were wearing I'm, shalwar kameez, yes. Yes, shalwar kameez, <laughs> and I was really proud. I think I was really nice on, in that suit. Uh, what happened then, I was on, uh, invited to open a Norwegian-Pakistani movie. It was the f first time Norwegians and Pakistani have made a movie together. And, um, I, and I think it was lovely that I was invited. I felt that finally I was, you know, getting into the warm. <laughs> yeah. And it was a huge event. It was like the Nor Norway's Oscar. Yeah. yeah. So it was like t thousand people, uh, you know, at the audience. Uh, and they were really, really proud. And it was a superstar um, uh, actor from Pakistan. I can't remember his name, but he was uh, playing the father uh, in that movie. Yeah. So it, it was about love marriage between uh -huh. a Norwegian guy and a Pakistani girl and uh, in Norway. So um and uh, i was really excited and i had to see the movie before you know it opened and i was shocked i was uh, really shocked because the solution in that movie was that that the norwegian guy he had to convert to uh, her religion he had to uh, circumcise himself and he had to write her signature uh, under a contract that if he ever thought about um, divorce, the father has the right to kill him. And he signed <laughs> and he had to do all that stuff. And then he got uh, the bride. OK, so that, that I, was a plot. I'm not movie. kidding. That that was the script. Oh, God. So okay. I don't know. How would you have opened this movie? <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and the female character, she had no lines, almost no lines. She was just happy that he she got her sweetheart at the end. Yeah. So I just had to say something and I felt so bad because it was the first time it was all this party and everybody was applauding that, oh, we are making movie together. So I felt so bad. What can, should I, you know, cancel the, the job? So I just went up on stage and I said, you know what? In movies, maybe Pakistani girls are like this, accepting all that. But in real life, we are not. And then I turned and I mooned the audience. Yeah, in Shalwar Kameez. In, in just... front, in front of the Pakistani superstar who was, <laughs> <laughs> who was playing the part. <laughs> and you know what? The, the what provoked me to do that? Uh, one thing was this crazy script, but the other thing was an interview this Pakistani uh, superstar have given, and he was a, a well-established actor in Pakistan. To, the, to a Norwegian film magazine, he said that art should never challenge the society's moral. Never. Oh, God, that's such bullshit. And he, he wasn't, you know, uh, receiving one single critical question saying this in Ibsen's homeland. Oh, my God. Yeah. And not one critical question. So I... Ha you would have moon too. <laughs> yeah, I well, that would if I, if I moon, then that would be terrorism. I think that you know <laughs> that would be a form. Yeah, but the not in my book. <laughs> but the but, the great thing I think, look, the, the the reason this is your position actually allows you to it actually gives you more power and makes you a more powerful figure is because you're from that community. So when you lift up Mullah Krekar, is that's his name, right? Krekar. Mm -hmm. Um so when you lift him up off the ground, um he can't complain that he was being harassed by some white Norwegian, you know, colonialist overlord, right? He can't say that. Because you are a girl from Karachi. Right? And this is what you did to a Mullah. Um, when you go and you wound the audience in Shirakamis, they can't say this is, you know, the West is trying to insult our culture. And they can't do that because, you know, you are a girl from Karachi, right? Who it's came there. Here. True. It's there. But you know what? Even all this is there or giving me more uh, space, you know, to explore. Yeah. But even though, you know, uh, what happened after that mooning, the same night, um, I, I still to this day don't know who did this but uh, a car passed by my sister's restaurant and shot 18 shot. Yes, 18 gunshots at the at the restaurant the same night but the the, the uh -oh. that was one thing but what happened is when uh, the morning after i was you know surrounded by like 100 journalists 
and the question they ask me uh and i can still don't never forget what they did because we were talking about you know um we were talking about what our community says to brothers see what your sisters are doing but mm -hmm. what the norwegian journalists did they went to my brother and uh, wanted to ask my mother do you think uh, your sisters went too far mm -hmm. and i was thinking that if a norwegian comedian mooned would they have gone to his sister or brother or her mother and asked sure. that question they did it to me because they behaved like the pakistani community and that was yeah. norwegian journalist there it is that's how pernicious this whole thing is it's just really mm -hmm. really Wow, I mean, but uh, so that once, but this is the thing, like the one stunt people might say, okay, you know, when you moon the audience, you know, it's just only shock value. But whenever you do these things, you expose, yes, right? You expose these layers of society. So not only do you expose the Pakistani hypocrisy, um, you also expose the way that you were raised and, and how you tried to bust out of it. But then you also expose how much the Norwegian journalists have internalized this sort of like patriarchal, um, yeah. aspect of Pakistani yeah. and, and yes. Islamic culture. Right? So that was my line. I said, I didn't strip my ass, I stripped your attitude. Okay, I, I can't say anything better than that. I think <laughs> you, should, you should end this right here without me. <laughs> yeah, I didn't just strip my ass, I stripped your attitude. So but you, you know, Ali, um, I survived all this. I still did comedy i went to exile in new york for some years after the gun uh, shots and i went back home to norway i continue my life but today i am concerned not because of me but because of the lack of guts uh, for the next gener generation and the last year i have been working uh, with um, uh, teenagers to um with comedy you know to coach them on comedy mm -hmm. and i was surprised that there is also a new generation who have been um, smitten by this cancel culture or the way they have thought themselves how their identity should be as minorities uh, some of them actually say openly we don't like irony mm -hmm. some of them said we did our irony is racist you know it's like they don't it's like someone who don't want to read to 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 teach how to read and write they don't want to have anything to do with humor mm -hmm. because they want to be this serious identity victims the, and they believe they doing in a comedy class then why are they getting coached in comedy the thing like, is they um what what they did was to uh, be there and to decide the script, decide who are going to work on it, and to um, attack the teenagers who actually were, were open for comedy. So it went, uh, uh, you know, they uh, at the school we were work working on, they actually started campaign against their own comedy oh, and God. that is concerning me that is really concerning and i don't know where that are uh, erasing from do you so this do you think is um is social media and the fact that we're seeing it rather than a new phenomenon and I, I mean that honestly like you know, there was a time when, you know, we've had controversial comedians in the past, you know, from Lenny mm -hmm. Bruce, Richard Pryor, you know, yeah. Carla, Eddie Murphy, Woody Allen, like all of these people were, you know, they caused stirs and issues in their in their own way, right? And uh, the only thing is everybody who was angry at them, uh, they had to write to the editor at a paper and the editors could choose whatever they wanted to publicize. Uh, but now every critic has a Twitter account and an Instagram, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Do you think that is what it is? Or do you think it's, uh, um, it is genuinely a new phenomenon? Because, you know, people have been get getting offended for the longest time. 
right? It's just yeah, that, yeah. That, that's that not something new. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's I, yeah. yeah. Go on. It's not something new, but what is new is that the, we have we are now dealing with people who have this victim power because mm. they are victimizing themselves as of uh, being offended. Uh, everyone can be offended. I think it's a human right to say that I'm offended. It's okay, but you, the thing is that you victimize yourself and you use that power uh, to censor other people, and that has grown in a way yeah, which grown. is out of control. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, they are spoiled. It's a spoiled nation who didn't really experience, you know, what. Uh, violence is what racism is what offense is yeah. it's like they they have victimized this uh, glamorous they have victimized now they have glamorized victimization and it's be become their identity and they are uh, you know uh, full of uh, power um, being uh, power sick of that and they are using it I know people who have lost their jobs, who are, have been, uh, you know, who have been uh, scared away from their social networks, who have been uh, went into silence because of these campaigns. So they are powerful. We can yeah. not, not just say that, oh, there are some crazy stuff going on. Uh, no, we I mean, have to deal with this. Yeah, no, we have to. But I think that the, one of the reasons that they're powerful now is that they actually have everybody has a platform, mm -hmm. right? Everybody has a platform. So the same people who at that time were just sort of these fringe voices that we could brush away, now you can't as easily because you're right, people are losing jobs mm -hmm. and so on. I, I was, uh, this reminds me of, you know, when you're talking about the victimization, the victim mentality, um, Stephen Fry has mm -hmm. talked about how self-pity and victimization, and I'm paraphrasing him, is one of the most malignant forms of narcissism, right? Mm. Because it gives you an excuse to focus all your attention on yourself. Mm -hmm. when you're feeling sorry for yourself when you think you're the victim. It gives you an excuse to just focus on your misery and what you went through and, com and, it, and completely shut out everybody else. And when you're feeling sorry for yourself and you're and engaged in self-pity, then you can also blame others for not feeling sympathy for you. Yeah. It is the ultimate and the most pernicious form of narcissism that there is. Right. Yeah. And, and this is um this is something I wish more people would talk about. But yeah. How do you combat it? Don't don't you like to me, whenever I've seen this stuff, whenever I've seen cancel culture and all that, um or when they tell you you can't draw cartoons of Muhammad. I just anything like that it just makes me want to do it more yeah. I don't look at my my Twitter notifications the more people get pissed off the more it energizes me if I obviously if I believe in what I'm doing how do yeah you, what, what is the, the problem is you have to keep fighting for uh, you know some uh, stages even if it's your column in a newspaper or your book or your podcast um, and be visible, but uh, the problem I see arising now is that if you got the, this victim uh, identity or narcissistic identity, you know, get the ally, uh, get to the press with them, and even politicians with them, you know, to mm -hmm. that's that's what I, I see, um, uh, you know, um, these things happening, growing in Norway, where. It's becoming popular to be to support these voices, and it th therefore it become more powerful. Uh, to be a totally free voice in a growing environment like this, uh, it's hard, and it's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. um, I just started a podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, I will still be writing. Uh, I'm visiting you and speaking about this. Yeah. That's what I can do, but also I have lost my jobs. Also, I have be ca be been experienced cancelling. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I have heard or right on my face that just because you are brown, you don't have a free pass to be a racist. So it's yeah. there, and it's th th that's why I'm concerned. How can we coach and teach the next generation about what comedy is uh, in an environment like this? 
But you should write a, a, a should... whole. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I just want to say that um, I don't wish my worst enemies to be like this <laughs> either. <laughs> I, I, like, I actually think, you know, that line if someone says, oh, just because you're brown doesn't mean you can't be racist. I think it'd be great to just write a comedy bit on why, yes, it does. It does <laughs> be right to be racist, actually. And here you're are the right. reasons, you know. It's the a right, great idea. Yeah, it's good. Write a good, like, nice four or five minute bit and just yeah. make it absolutely hilarious. Why, why, you know, it's, it's good to be racist. I might actually do that. I don't know. Um, we should write it together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we should. So, what's uh, next for you? I wanted to also mention, I mean, if you guys want to go, everybody's listening, if you want to go and, and look up Shibana stuff online, uh, it's there. There's one of the most powerful clips that you have, and I before we go, I, we only have like six, seven minutes left, so I wanted to make sure that I mentioned this, is when you were up, I think, doing a talk and you had the Quran with you and mm -hmm. you were talking about burning the Quran and yes. you said you lit the match and you were about to burn it. And then I don't, I don't know, do you want to tell it or? Yeah, I do. Yeah. And uh, I think that have uh, English subtitles as well. Uh, are you there? I think I lost yeah. you. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, but you can see me. I can see you. Yes. You okay. can't see me. Uh, no, um, but uh, I no, I can't. But I will try to find you anyway. But yeah, uh, the stunt is um, threatening to not burn the Quran. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it it was a, 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 a actually this this was a stunt with many layers because the fourth story for that was uh, I think um, there was a Norwegian officer in Afghanistan. Who was killed after an um, American pastor or something burned a Quran? Uh, so there were demonstrations in Afghanistan where uh, several people were killed, and one of them was uh, a Norwegian officer. So I was invited to open the um, a literature f festival in Norway, uh, where the theme was uh, dangerous books. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and my point was when I lifted up the Quran, lifted up <laughs> the Quran, and I find the biggest, uh, you know, uh, matches. It's called matches, you know. The, yeah, matches. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I found, uh, and uh, the message was um, for everyone now in our time. This is world's most dangerous books, and if I burn this book now. And I hold it, and the amazing thing was the reaction at the audience. They get this painful face looks. It was like someone was hurting them there and then, just of the uh, line that if I burn the Quran, they were like hiding themselves, like I'm going to explode a bomb or something. They have physical reaction yeah. at the audience. Uh, and then I said, if I burn this book, uh, it would become more dangerous. So I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I knew that just holding the Quran and not burning it will provoke the real fanatics. Yeah. You know? And it did. It did. Why are you holding the Quran? And even uh, in Norwegian pace. A newspaper they said Chabana is provoking uh, people by uh, burning the Quran stunt. Yeah. And I said, no, it was not burning the Quran stunt. And yeah. that's what comedians have to say reach out their message and, you know, provoke out the trolls mm -hmm. and expose them. So and that, I mean, that stunt did that. Yeah, you you held up the Quran. You were about to. It's like it looked like you were about to burn it on stage. The entire f audience was freaking out. You had the match lit, and the fire close to it. And then I I think you blew it out, or you did. Yeah. You said no, I'm not going to do this because if I do this, this is going to give it power. It's going to make it even more more dangerous. power. Yeah, and it's uh. So I mean that was so brilliant. Yeah. Like, everything. So it, to be you able know, to use. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. It's the whole thing as a comedian, you know, to find ways to say what you want to say without being beheaded. And <laughs> that's our challenge and have always been our challenge. 
Yeah, this is, I mean, again, there's a lot of, I think, people who take this stuff superficially, they just do shock humor for the sake of shock humor, just because they think pissing people off is the only goal. Um, mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with pissing people off. But when you do it, when you're doing it, and there's a purpose, and there's a message, and there's a lesson in there, it's more powerful than any sort of, I think, any op-ed or any book or any article in any magazine or any live intellectual debate at a university because um, people are not uh, ideologically, you know, it breaks down their guard, their ideological prejudices, it breaks it down and it makes it more, makes them more receptive when they're experiencing things in that way. Uh, Uh, Yeah, I think therefore it's so important that we have uh, so many comedians as we could uh, with Muslim background because there are challenges in the Muslim societies because there are so many much censor there. Mm. Uh, You know, because we can, we have the uh, opportunity to go on deeper levels, you know, to express the comedy, to say, uh, tell the truth and do it, like you said, in that way that if you laugh, you understand. Yeah, so uh, we're I mean, we're we're up to an hour now. We're at time, and I wish I could talk to you for way way longer than this. And hopefully, we'll do this again at some point if you have time. But of I course, have, I would love to. I have just uh, two more things to ask you. Number one uh, is, what are your biggest comedic influences when you look back with other comedians? Who are some of the people who you think are the the greatest that inspired you? Um. I have been searching, you know, for comedians who inspire me because um, being so hunted. um, But I have seen, I I like the story of Lenny Bruce. I love Charlie Chaplin. And there is an American lady. um, I can't come up with her name now, but she was like in the 50s. Uh, I really like to see the first comedians, you know, uh, who were uh, taboo breaking more than today's comedians. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I have been founding inspiration by by going back in time. Yeah, I, I was. I suppose like when you, when I think of taboo breaking comedians, I think a lot of Richard Pryor, just because. Yeah, of course. Because he was. He was yeah, for- I love the thing that there are no niggers in Africa. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, yeah. He's he like the the stuff that he and and you know the way that he did the his background actually his life story was incredible because he was born to a prostitute right and was kind of grew up in a brothel um and then he just made I think this black man who just grew up and became this absolute icon such a pioneer and he, uh, he was born to, to a prostitute there that's yeah, the main well, main theme in ma- many bollywood movies you know <laughs> yeah and I, i've been reflecting on that because the the, the prostitution prostitutes are, are um a way in many Bollywood films to show scenes, you know, with dancing, with more freely culture, or with the main character being a son of a prostitute or something. And I find it very interesting because uh, then you have, uh, you know, you have your shit and you have to, you can say things and explore things more freely because, uh, because of the prostitution or the life or what uh, whatsoever because there are people like they uh, really are because the yeah. sexual boundaries are so strong uh, and, and and so killing that um, many movie script has to go you know to the whorehouses to yeah. express yeah. scenes they could right yeah uh, Just- uh, <laughs> yeah the last Shabana, what is next for you? Just quickly, what's next for you and uh, where can people find you? Um, online. You can find me online. Uh, there are many YouTube videos. There are some with English subtitles, but um, there are also some um, English speaking shows I did in New York. Uh, but you can find me uh, on my homepage, shabana.no. I am at social media, I'm at, at Twitter. Uh, please feel free to take contact and share your thoughts. Yeah, so on Twitter, you're Shabana Rahman. That's uh, S-H-A-B-A-N-A-R-E-H-M-A-N, correct? Yes, yeah. correct. And okay. I'm on Instagram also, oh, at yeah. Shabana Rahman 76. Perfect. Okay, so everyone's going to find it. If, if anybody who's listening to this, if you like this, just make sure you go to secularjihadist.com. Um, and subscribe uh, if you want to watch the video version of this. If you're listening to this, you want to watch the video version, 
uh, show and subscribe to loads of videos with not only Shma, but other comedians like the ones I mentioned, like Mohammed, like Jafar Khan, uh, like Vidu Vids, and then, uh, you know, many, many other people. So, um, absolutely consider uh, becoming a patron. But anyway, Shabana, uh, thank you. And yeah, everybody else, make sure you click subscribe and hit the bell and, you know, all that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Usually Armin does this and, you know, so now I'm doing it. I'm not <laughs> as good at it as he is. Mm -hmm. But uh, Shabana, thank you so much. It's been such an honor. This has been so much fun. Hopefully when the pandemic is over, we can hang out in person again like we did in Amsterdam. Um, yeah, I would were, love to. There were so many people there and I wanted to actually... I was hoping to talk to you more, but it was just so many people uh, at that conference. So uh, hopefully, you know. I if know. You ever... I was hoping to to see you again. So this was a nice opportunity. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. Yeah, we should do this more. Thank you. Okay, so have a great rest of the day, and um, hopefully uh, we'll have you back on to talk and just talk comedy again. It'd be great. Keep in touch. Yeah. Bye bye. The Secular Jihadists have been made possible thanks to the Illuminati and the covert support of Israel and the CIA. That's what we have been told, but we haven't received our checks yet. If you like what we do, please support us. Share the podcast with your friends, write and tweet us with topic and guest suggestions, or head over to secularjihadists.com and give a dollar or more for exclusive access to live video. Have your questions read and answered on the air and more. Till next time, may the flying spaghetti monster be with you. Thank <laughs> you.